Michael, uh, unlike you, I don't remember 50 years ago, but, uh, but thank you very much. Now, in a world of turmoil and difficulty, and times when people don't quite know the right way to go in their own lives, and when the world around us is confusing, what we've come tonight to consider is, is my belief, and the belief of other people here, that the Bible is what it claims to be, which is the revealed word of the living God. And that it holds out to us a wonderful hope for the future that we can really put confidence in and put our trust in. And before I get on to that, I just want to say three things by, by way of introduction. The first is that we are going tonight to be talking about the nation and the people of Israel, who are obviously a, a literal people in a literal land. It's very important we make the point to start with, we are not a political people. I didn't vote in the recent general election, that's, that's another story. But where we come from is as observers. So I'm, when I talk tonight about the nation of Israel and the people, it is because where I'm, I'm looking at the Bible and saying, is there a connection between what the Bible is saying and what's happening around us in the world? And because of that, therefore, I just want you to bear that in mind. That's what I'm doing. I'm laying open an, a possible evidence before you. And it's for you to make up your mind whether it's just a coincidence or whether there's a connection between those things. <coughs> The second thing to say is there's a lot of information I could bring to your attention, and I'm going to be trying to do that in as realistic a manner as I can, but understand there's a lot more behind this. In fact, there's some books here which, if you haven't seen before, are fascinating. The point is, this is not a book of fairy stories. If nothing else, it, it doesn't claim to be a history book, but it is rooted in the historical record. And if nothing else, it's important we recognise that and we, we come to understand that. And the third thing is this, if we could see a connection between what the Bible has been saying over thousands of years and what has happened in our world and what is happening today, that could be the basis upon which to build our life. And that's why we take it seriously. <clears throat> well, let's start by thinking about this subject then. The first is most obvious, that when we read in the Bible about Jerusalem, well, it's, it's everywhere. You can see it's a very frequently occurring idea. In fact, if we were to add in the, the word Zion as well as being around that locality, well, we'd have another 150 odd references. So we don't go very far from the idea that we find in the Bible to this particular place. And what's interesting is it's not only forefront and centre in the Bible, it is in our world. I mean, how extraordinary that one place should have the focus of the world's attention upon it to such a degree. Interesting, isn't it, that it's there in the Bible and it's there in our world. And in fact, you can see that there is a focus that people have towards it. it certainly in the land of Israel, that there's one sort of focus. And if we were to open the pages of our Bible, then we could turn them pretty well, not quite back to the beginning, but quite a long way back and read about a man called Abraham. And he had a big journey to make. He came from what we would understand as modern day Iraq and crossed all the way over towards Canaan, or the land of Israel as we know it today. And when he was there, the book of Genesis records something that God said to him. The Lord said to Abraham, lift up your eyes from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. That's a promise. And that's a promise from the Almighty to one man. And that's worth bearing in mind. We're going to, we're going to come back to that idea that that land was in fact promised originally to Abraham. Now, as we read on in the record, we understand that actually... God asked Abraham uh, to do something difficult. He had one son. Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, of which I shall tell you. <clears throat> now the word Moriah is not, is not, or the name Moriah is not one we use uh, terribly frequently. I'm not sure if this is, is there a pop store 
Fox Darkwall there. Well, I'm not really sure. But, uh, but uh, it's not that one, uh, in any case. There is a connection. Go to this particular place, God said, to one of the mountains, to the land of Moriah. And so off he goes. And as we read it in the book of Genesis, he is just about to do what God has asked him to do, which is to kill his own son. And just as he's about to raise the knife, the angel calls out of heaven and says, Stop! And there have been various artistic uh, attempts. This, this is wrong, actually, for two reasons. The first is because it says, actually, that, uh, that the angel called from heaven. But the second is because this, the angels have wings. Well, the angels may have wings, but we don't read of them in the Bible, so we'll just uh, dispense with those for a moment. Um, <laughs> but uh, what is rather lovely is two things I like. The way that he's looking at the angel, as you would. And the second is that you notice that his son Isaac is not a babe. As the scripture points out, he was probably quite a young man and could have resisted. But the point is what God then says to Abraham at this place of Moriah. Because you have done this thing, you've been willing to obey me. Blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because you've obeyed my voice. So to this man God gives a blessing and an opportunity. And because of his obedience. He also says that in you everyone can find blessing. To be made happen is really the root idea. And I want you to just tuck that idea away. Because we'll come back to that. So the point is that there in the land of Moriah. On the mountain. That's where he was going to offer his son. And in obedience to his father's request, to, to his, his God's request. Now, we can move onward a little and come to King David. Perhaps one of the greatest of Israel's kings, as we read of it. And he had an interesting opportunity. He started off reigning as king in Hebron, and then later he moved to Jebus or Jerusalem as he made it. Now, this is a photograph of modern day Jerusalem. Here's perhaps the most famous landmark, the Dome of the Rock, right in the center. And the city of David is really this area here. This is where he uh, captured originally and built up. And what's really interesting about this is here's a model of that same city that was circled, the city in David's time. And the mount that's just above it, you can just perhaps make out here is Mount Moriah, just to the north of where his own city was. So the very place where Abraham had been willing to offer his own son is just to the north of the city, where David lives and where he reigns. Now, that's going to be significant as we move on. David reigning in Jerusalem, as we said, is here, and God says a message to him. When your days are fulfilled and you come to the end of your life, you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. David, you're going to have a son, and I'm going to establish his throne. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. A promise from God to David. Your kingdom, your dynasty is going to go on forever. Now that would be quite something, wouldn't it? If you were David and you received that. I, I mean, you know, I'm, if, if you think of, uh, if you know any of the Shakespeare plays, and that, 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 uh, even just in any kind of monarchy, the idea of what's going to happen to you and your legacy and your dynasty. God says to David, yours is going to go on forever. But David, faithful man as he was, didn't always do quite the right thing. And there was an occasion when it was necessary for him. He was, he was seeking God's, God's answer for a problem that had occurred because of a mistake that he'd made. And there was a particular point where an angel, interestingly, just as it was an angel appeared to Abraham, an angel appears to Abraham and says, well, you must do this to solve your problem. And it was in the most unlikely of places. It was in a threshing floor where the angel appeared. And the command was, 
Gad the prophet came to David and said to him, well, you must go up and put up an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arona, the Jebusite. That was the name of the man who was there. So David did it. He built an altar and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the Lord. And he answered him from heaven. And that became for David the place where he offered to God and where he found a connection to God. Now, I'm building up a picture and there's a reason. Obviously, I'm, I'm emphasizing that point. So we'll just move on to his son Solomon. And when Solomon was reigning and was king over Israel, well, he built a temple. It was the very thing that David had wanted to do, a temple in Jerusalem for the worship of the God of Israel. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in, in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father, in the place that David had prepared, in the threshing floor of Orn and the Jebusite. Now, isn't this interesting? So the very same place that now is in Jerusalem is the same place that is termed Mount Moriah, which is where Abraham, remember, was about to offer Isaac and where God appeared to him through the angel. And now that's the very place where now David has seen the angel and now he's going to build the temple. In actual fact, if we went back and we're not going to to the words of Moses centuries before, then God was telling him, there will be a place when you get into the land of Israel, because they were wandering around in the desert. When you get to the land, there'll be a place to worship God. One place. And in actual fact, here it was. Now, this is extraordinary, isn't it, in a way? There's a God who is outside time. At least the Bible reveals him to be so. And not to be limited by place. And yet he is selecting a place. A place for worship. Perhaps in the first case because we are creatures of space and time. Although I think it goes beyond that. But anyway, we've made the connection. It's just worth bearing in mind. So we go on with our story. And we move on this time a little bit further. To the time when after David in the nation of Israel. That kingdom split into two in actual fact. In the south you had Judah. In the north you had Israel. And most of the kings, sad to say, were not good in God's sight. All of them in Israel, the Bible says, were not following God's ways. And most of them in Judah didn't, although there were some bright exceptions. And, well, God said, this is my land. You're not here just to do what you like. And he said, you can only be in my land if you're being obedient to me. And so Israel, the northern kingdom, was taken by the Assyrians and, and left and never returned. And Judah, for 70 years, was taken to Babylon. And Babylon was one of the great empires at that time. And the man that we read of in the Bible, Nebuchadnezzar II, is well known to ancient history. Uh, there is a brick with his name on you. Can, I've, seen, I've seen such a brick. Not that I can read his name, but the experts tell me that it's there. And... This was the man who took Israel, who took Judah in actual fact, to Babylon. See, the events that we read of in the Bible are rooted in history. They're not just fairy stories. So what was said to the last king of Judah is very significant. Just remember now what God had said to David. You're going to have a son and your dynasty is going to last forever. There was no ifs or maybes. It was a definite promise to David. And David understood it. But look what was said to the last king. To you, O profane, wicked prince of Israel, whose day has come, whose iniquity shall end, thus says the Lord God, remove the turban. Now the turban related to the priestly garments. Remember that I talked about the temple. Well, in the temple were the priests who did God's work and they had a very specific dress code. It wasn't anything like ours at all, if you, if you read it in the books that God gave, for God's purposes. And there was some headgear that the priest wore called a turban, as it says. So when he says remove the turban, he's saying the priesthood is coming to an end. Worship in the temple is going to stop. And not only that, 
take off the crown. The, the kingdom aspect is going to go as well. This, this was the measure that God had for that nation at that time. Nothing shall remain the same. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more. And that would be the end of the promise that God had made to David. No more king, no more priest, no more temple, forever. Is it? You see, this is why we have to read the Bible so carefully. Look at this one word. Until. The priest and the king are removed from Israel in 500 years before the Lord Jesus Christ. Until. And the passage doesn't say what the position is that would lead to that changing. It just says until. Well, it says, doesn't it? It says until he come whose right it is. And I will give it him. So there's one coming in the future, he says, 500 years before the Lord Jesus, whose who's right it is to sit upon that throne. Now there's a little loose end, we'll leave dangling just for the moment. And the time now moves on. Because now we're going to come to the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. I said that there was no longer a kingdom in Israel. The rulership that was there was under the dominating emperor of the time, which was the Roman Empire. And at this time, Herod, Herod the Great, was the ruler at that time. And he had these great building projects. He was a great builder. That's what he, what he really loved to do, amongst, amongst other things. And, well, he set in mind to produce the most amazing thing. The temple that had been there from Solomon's day, well, it had been, in actual fact, that the Jews had come back after 70 years. It had been rebuilt and then destroyed. And he said, I'm going to make it the most magnificent thing ever. And, and this, is, this is a model of that temple that Herod built. This was the temple that was there when we read of it in the New Testament, when Jesus went there. That's what it was like. You could see it a mile off. It glinted in the sun with the, with the gold along the top. It was a beautiful thing to behold. And when you looked at it, there's something quite interesting. Just note this carefully. The top of the mount, that's where, that's in the center of that temple, is actually the very place where Abraham had been about to offer Isaac. At least that's Mount Moriah. You remember, originally, David's city was a little to the south. By this time, it's grown. The city's grown. And the center of the temple is here. And that's the first thing, then, that the, the heart of the temple is at that point. And then, well, that was the size of Solomon's temple. But Herod said, look, there's, there's more I can do here. He did huge work to fill in various valleys and other bits and pieces and build on debris that had accumulated. And that was the size of his temple platform. The temple was still in the middle, but all around it was this huge temple platform area that he built in the center of Jerusalem. So that the whole thing looked more like this. There's the temple we saw, but here's all this colonnades at this end and a fortress here to protect it in case of trouble. So it was a huge effort. It says in the New Testament it took 46 years to complete building. Now, that then was going on during the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just think about him for a moment. We've got Herod over here doing all his stuff in league with the Romans and trying to curry favor with the Jews. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ coming onto the scene. When he was going to be brought about, the angel appeared to Mary. And the angel said to Mary, this promise about the Lord Jesus Christ he shall be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give unto him the throne of his father, David. So that throne that 500 years before was overturned and wouldn't happen until he came whose right it is, said God. Here's an angel appearing to Jesus' mother saying, he's the man. He's the one whose right it is. Because I'm going to give it him. He's going to sit on the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. 
Now, you can see this immediately. It's one thing to say to David, your kingdom and your dynasty is going to go on forever. But this man is going to go on forever because he's going to be king forever. You see, there's something unique about this, isn't there? And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And that, in actual fact, of course, is how the promise that God made to David would be fulfilled in the future. I will establish his kingdom forever. So there was a a looking forward that would happen. Well, that's all very lovely. Of course, Jesus, when he did his own mission and his own work, well, he knew that it wasn't going to happen in his life. Towards the end of his life, when he saw how the Jews were treating God and that temple, beautiful it was, but, but inside it was rotten. In the sense that the people who were in it were not seeking God in the right way, said Jesus. And, and when his disciples asked him about the beauty of the temple and, the, and all the buildings and everything, well, look what he said. You see all these things. I'm telling you, there isn't going to be one stone upon another that won't be thrown down. You can imagine they looked at it in all its beauty and its glory, and it had only just been completed, or was being completed, that whole temple platform. And Jesus said, it's all going to be knocked down. And he went further in actual fact. The days are going to come when your when enemies shall surround you, build an embankment, close you in. Jerusalem will be surrounded by armies. And then you know its desolation is near. These be the days of vengeance, that all these things which are written may be fulfilled. So Jesus says, look, it's all going to come to an end. And what's more, it's fulfilling something that's been written a long time ago. Because God wrote it. Just as God said to to, to Jesus' mother, he's going to be the king. God said also, it's going to come to an end. Just think of what God said to and through. He said through Moses, centuries before. Here's Moses with his Ten Commandments, right? And Moses wrote, The Lord shall bring a nation against you from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose tongue you won't understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which won't regard the person of the old or show favour to the young. And he shall besiege you in all your gates until your high and fenced walls come down. So when Jesus said the things that were written a long time ago, that's what he's talking about. The the, the very siege that he spoke of, and in actual fact this has already happened. There's a repeating pattern in Jerusalem's history through the centuries. It's out when Babylon had come down. But this problem of being desolated but now specifically a siege is being spoken of a siege and the enemies building to surround the city and of course it happened the Lord Jesus died there or thereabouts 33 didn't he and in AD 70 the Roman historian well he was a Jew to start off with and Josephus switched sides and is recognized as a useful source to be used as all historians would caution, but a useful, such a useful account that people have been able to plot within what happened, his record of what happened, because he became the official historian for the Romans, that they did indeed build a wall, just as Jesus had predicted when the city was destroyed. And really terrible devastation upon that city as the fire raged. In actual fact, The Roman general did not want, famously, to burn the temple. He recognized its beauty and its significance, and he tried everything to stop it. And yet, God had said, there shall not be left one stone upon another. And, well, that's what happened. Interestingly, only just recently, we could read in the papers about how they had found the evidence of this wall that had been built and the things that spoke of what Jesus had said coming to pass, the remains discovered of the tower thought to have stood atop the third wall and the wall breached during the Roman conquest. 
So you see, when we look back at scripture, at the Bible, there is a connection to real things in our world. That's what Jesus said would happen. And the evidence is it did. And that wasn't all. He talked about not leaving in you one stone upon another. Not one stone shall be left upon another, in Matthew, he says. And so there's another thing, then, that we can look back then and say, well, did that happen? It's interesting, when you look at the wall there in Jerusalem today, that place that's the focus of so much attention and difficulty, well, we don't want to just look at it as a wall, but there's something to notice in actual fact. If you look down at the bottom part of the wall, it may not be immediately apparent, but the stones at the bottom are much bigger than those at the top. They actually get smaller as you go up to the top. And those at the bottom, which are really quite huge, are actually the foundation stones from the retaining wall that Herod built. Remember I said there was that huge platform that he built. And these stones are just the edge of that big platform, that big sort of rectangular platform. And what's left in Jerusalem today, that's the last bit, really, that's left that wall. There's the bit that you can see from the outside, the western wall, and there's another bit hidden within a tunnel. But just to make that point, here is the wall here. And it relates to this section of the wall here, which is part, as you see, of that, just of that wall, of that retaining wall that the temple was atop. And if you go inside that tunnel, the scale of the walls are just enormous. This is the nature of the, of the walls that were required that, for Herod to build that structure. But the temple had to be destroyed. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until there's another until. So let's just think a little bit more about what these various predictions are saying. Well, we looked at the first one about the siege war. We looked at, uh, th think now then, of this idea of every stone, not one stone being left. Well, you can go to Jerusalem today and see stones that are there. For centuries they were covered up. Stones that, that the Romans pushed off the top of that platform and landed on the pavement with the result that archaeologists have uncovered the damage that was there. So that's all that left of that great temple is just that retaining wall, just as the Lord Jesus had spoken. So the temple was to be leveled, not one stone of it left upon another, and it's there to be seen. Jesus goes on, they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until. There's another until. The things here had an end. The Lord shall scatter thee, Moses had said, among all people from one end of the earth to the other. Jesus was, can you imagine when Jesus said this, what his hearers would have thought? Here was the whole civilization coming to an end. The temple destroyed, all the people going to all parts of the world. What an extraordinary thing to predict. And you know, it happened. These, these are map, this is just a map of Jews in the Middle Ages. But I mean, there's a, an amazing book. If you haven't seen this book, do come and have a look at it. This book chronicles the journeys of the Jews through the centuries. God says, they're a witness to me in obedience or disobedience. Because he's chosen them, not for any, not because they're better than any people, not because they're, he says this, not because they're certainly not because they're a bigger nation than anybody, but because I loved you because of the faith of Abraham. God says that. And Jesus said, well, that's what's going to happen to them. They're going to be scattered through the nations, and it happened. You can find Jews, as you know, in every country of the world. And Jerusalem would be trampled by Gentiles until, that's just an interesting point to note, there's the emperor Hadrian, and in 130 he actually founded a city on the top, and he struck a coin 
uh, to celebrate the fact of which this is a, it's only a replica, but it, should you wish to come and see it later, then then do. To to demonstrate the fact that now these problematic Jews who kept rioting and being so troublesome to the Roman Empire, Empire that's the end of them. They're no longer there. And uh, there's the coin I mentioned. So when we come to consider what Jesus had said, you see, Jerusalem was to be trampled by non-Jews. That happened too. And yet even that wasn't quite the end of the story. Because Jesus said, until, until there was going to be something else. And as we move through the centuries, then the land of Israel, after the time of the Romans, became taken over by the Muslim power. There were various bits of the Crusaders in the Middle Ages, but for much of that period, and certainly in 631, then the Dome of the Rock became the focus of attention. And that, of course, is the most visible evidence of that that you can see in the land today. It's quite interesting, actually. If you just remember the, the pattern that we saw before and the great platform that Herod had built and that we can see in this model here, you can see the outline of that platform here, can't you? Even to this day. And there, the Dome of the Rock sits on that very same place. When they built it, they said, well, where was the place? They asked the inhabitants at the time, and they'd chosen the same place. There's some evidence for that in one of these books here. But you know, if you go back to that wall, it's almost a record of the history of what happened to Israel during that period. I mentioned these really big stones in the Roman rule up to about 638 when that uh, Dome of the Rock was built. And then these other stones relate to later periods when the wall was extended and built upwards. It's almost, it's almost like a measure of what happened to the city during that period. And for all of that period, it might well have looked as though Jesus' words were true, but the until seemed an awfully long time coming. Jerusalem was going to be occupied and trampled by non-Jews. And when was the until going to come? Remember, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There would be a time when that would change. Now, what I want to do is just briefly summarize the teachings of four prophets that we find in the Old Testament. Because they give us an insight into what that until means of how the period of the, the downtreading of Jerusalem, as the Bible calls it, would come to an end. Here's Isaiah. Fear not, he says, I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not keep back. Here's the nation of Israel, scattered into all four corners of the earth, just as Jesus said they would be, only <coughs> Isaiah is writing about 700 years before Jesus. And he says this, let all the nations be gathered together. Let them bring forth their witnesses. This is the challenge now. He says, let them hear and say it is true. God says, you're my witnesses. God says, look at the Jews. How is it, he says, that this nation which has been scattered into all four corners of the earth is still identifiable as a distinct nation. And there's more. So Isaiah tells us that the people of Israel are to be gathered. Not only were they to be scattered, but they were to be gathered back into the land from all corners of it. Jeremiah says, I am with you, says the Lord. Though I make a full end of all nations where I've scattered you, I'll not make a full end of you. You could go to all kinds of places where the Jews have been, and they're still identifiable. I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the ends of the earth. Hear the word of the Lord. He who scattered Israel will gather him. So the Bible is certainly calling out to us, saying, look, just keep an eye on what's happening with that nation. They've suffered for their unbelief. God still has a purpose with them. And as long as they're around, they cause us to think and to wonder. 
God will preserve Israel as a distinct nation. That's what we read in Jonah. And he will gather them back to the land of Israel. We can read, uh, as, as the centuries go on, we can find that in Jerusalem, there were Jews at various periods, limited numbers. Uh, at one point, the Sultan of Turkey in the mid-1850s allowed them to go back to the land. And here's a photograph, actually, of them in that period in the land of Israel. And interestingly, there's little snippets of them uh, at the wall in various places and at various times. Uh, still having that real focus, it was the closest thing, it was the last thing left to that great temple that had been there. And as we come into the 20th century, well then, the Balfour Declaration, which is 100 years old this year, is, was the British government at that time saying, well, it's about time the Jews went back to their land, or at least to the land of Israel, and a very controversial document we know it to have been. That was in November 1917. In December 1917, during the First World War, Jerusalem actually was taken by the British, and that was quite something in itself. There's some British soldiers actually just after Jerusalem had been taken from the Turkish army, and a British policeman very suitably attired in 1934. Now, now, here's an interesting thing. Remember, what well, the sign we were looking for was that Jerusalem would be trampled by Gentiles, non-Jews, until. And what we're looking for is the until. All the other parts of Jesus' prophecy had happened. And for the rest of it to come true, the Jews would have to still be in existence, wouldn't they? And there'd have to be an opportunity for them to go back at some point. But they were in all the countries of the world with no particular desire to go back. True, Herzl had started Zionism, hadn't he, in 1897, and some of them had started to go back. But the thing that really got it going was the Second World War and the, the horrors of the Holocaust, wasn't it? And when they began to understand that there was really only one place where they wanted to be. So in due course, the state of Israel was declared. An extraordinary thing when you think then that after all those centuries, when the nation of Israel had been scattered into all corners of the earth, they were still there, able to go back to the land of Israel. And, and as I say, we're not here to, to talk about the rights and wrongs of their being there or what happened there or anything of like that. We're just saying God said that they would be there. There was a bit more to happen yet, as we shall see. And if you were watching the Bible at that time, well, you'd have wondered, wouldn't you? How remarkable that God had predicted it, and now there they are in their land, and there they have been ever since. Interestingly, when you look on the map, from 48 to 67, it was under Jordanian control, all of that area. And the West Bank was called the West Bank because it was the West Bank of the River Jordan. And the Sixth Day War of 1967 that Michael alluded to was this really remarkable time when Israel, through conquest, took back that particular, or took that particular area. And within it was that wall and that area. So there, in actual fact, after, immediately after that wall, after that wall was the religious leader blowing his shofar. And you know, that's the first time as they began to clear all the debris that was underneath and all around this wall, and some of those, the evidence of those stones that I said the Romans pushed off, those stones had been buried all through that period. And when the archaeologists got to work, they found them under all this rubble for 2,000 years. Evidence of Jesus saying there'll be left not one stone upon another. And they will fall by the edge of the sword until, just think of it, Israel exiled, Israel regathered. After 2,000 years. That was the first time Jerusalem being trampled by Gentiles until. That was the first time when you could have said in 1967, the promise of Jesus has come true. All of those things that he said. It was the first time you could have said that. Jews evicted from the land, the temple destroyed at four corners until. Now there may be more to it, but certainly there's, well, there's the reason that Michael's parents were so excited. There's the Bible coming to life in front of you. The prediction, and then it happening. And as time has gone on, 
the population of Israel has continued to increase such that now, at least in 2013, 46% of Israel, uh, of Jews are actually in Israel, greater than in any other country. So of all of those things that Jesus predicted, you can see that there was the final element completed. There were all kinds of things predicted in the Bible. And we can be certain that what God has said, he will complete. There's a wonderful promise that he gives to us. There, the things that are happening in our world now, there's a prophecy in the book of Ezekiel that talks of a dwelling safety. And whether that's what we're seeing now or not, we don't know. But we're going to keep our eyes open as Bible readers. A time when Israel will be secure and at peace. It doesn't appear they are now. Whether the things that are happening in our world are evidence of this beginning to develop or not, we don't know. But one thing we can say, that the Bible is being shown to be true. And as our world continues to progress, towards the end that God has desired for it. He will fulfill his great purpose. You see, the end of the story, after a time of great turmoil, a time when Jesus said in Luke 21, people's hearts would fail them, and they wouldn't know what was happening. The end of the story would be that the Lord Jesus would return. He would come to set up his kingdom. It would be in the very days when the until had happened. Do you remember? I said until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, that would be the very time when he would return. The very time when the end of God's purpose, so to speak, would come to its climax. You remember the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the time... We're waiting for. When Jesus, immediately before he was taken up to heaven, he, he, the angel said to his disciples as, as he went up, why, why are you looking up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from heaven, he's going to come back in just the same way. And, and Jesus has told us the time when he's going to come back is the time when Israel are back in their land and when Jerusalem is no longer under control of non-Jews. And you look around the world and you say, well, is, is this the world we're living in? Is it a world of fear? Is it the kind of world that the Lord Jesus will bring peace to? And we very much believe and hope that it is. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ is he of whom it is written, King of Kings. It is he who is going to sit on the throne of his father David and put the world to right. It is he who is going to fulfill the promise that was made to David of a king who would sit upon his throne and rule for him. It is he of whom we read in Ezekiel, of he whose right it is. So God has a purpose. He has a purpose with his people and with his kingdom. And he's going to bring blessing through his people. A time of wonderful peace and blessing for everyone. And the question, really, then, is how that blessing applies to us. When the Lord Jesus comes, he's going to make that promise to Abraham ultimately true. That in him, in the Lord Jesus Christ, as his descendant, everyone can find blessing and happiness. And the challenge, then, is this. As we started thinking about the promises that God had made at the beginning, we, we've seen, haven't we, how God through his word, gave us evidence of how he picked out a particular place and a particular people. And now we can add to that and say a particular time. The times in which we live, as far as we can see from everything we, we have in the Bible. We don't know, as the Bible says, the day or the hour, but we do know the period. And if, if over all of that time we can see any connection between what the Bible said would happen and what has happened, then we can ask ourselves, well, if that's true, is it a coincidence or is it a fulfillment of what God has said? 
And if it is a fulfillment of what God has said, what does that mean for me in my life today? If the Lord Jesus is coming back, am I looking for him? And do I want to receive him with joy when he comes? 